Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We have a tremendous interview with Diego Gutierrez. He leads a lot of the Bitcoin community in Latin America and just has started a new project called Rootstock. So welcome to the podcast, Diego. Thank you, Trace. Yeah, Happy th- to be with you again. Again, yeah. This is uh, <laughs> one of the few guests that we've actually had on twice. What is Rootstock? Like, what, what is this uh, new project that you're moving forward with? Rootstock is the first uh, ultra complete smart contracts platform implemented as a Bitcoin sidechain. A lot of jargon, but conceptually, it's bringing smart contracts to Bitcoin and, and giving incentives to the, all the Bitcoin industry to profit from smart contract execution instead of taking the smart contract value away like other platforms have done. Yeah, so this is uh, actually putting it directly interoperable via sidechain with the main Bitcoin chain, exactly. but still Turing complete like the Ethereum project? Exactly, and then, and we took great care to be totally backward compatible with Ethereum. So all the Ethereum development community can be assured that their projects will run perfectly smooth on Rootstock. So that's another important thing. We, we are trying to bring together <laughs> some balance to the force as we like to play around. <laughs> <laughs> so who are some of the, the other people involved uh, directly in the Rootstock project? Well, the mastermind behind Rootstock is Sergio Lerner, which is very well known. Oh, yeah. The, he, core, core developer, found yes. several security vulnerabilities in Absolutely. Bitcoin itself. Yes, he's a very smart guy. He, he has found uh, many security uh, issues in, in Bitcoin long long way ago. So he has been working on smart contracts um, platforms uh, before Ethereum was even born. In early 2013, he had QuickScoin. So a lot of intellectual work has been done during the last two years that took us to this moment. So it's, it's not something... I mean, Rootstock itself as a concept uh, was born very recently. I would say the, the initial moment of Rootstock was after I had a, a chat with Nick Sabo over a glass of wine, white wine, in Silicon Valley. And, and we, were, we were discussing exactly this. I mean, we wanted a smart contracts platform that you can use in real case applications versus creating something that was uh, you know, trying to be state of the art. I mean, we, we have a very pragmatic approach to smart contracting. Now, where, where do you see smart contracts going? Like, are they going to be a significant value or use case with Bitcoin? Rootstock is born out of necessity. So we already have a lot of real case applications in mind when we started Rootstock. And that's part of the work we have been doing in Latin America, researching what Latin America needs in terms of cryptocurrencies and how cryptocurrencies can work in real life scenarios. I mean, you need, for example, a, a peg asset to the local currency. And without a more powerful programming language, you cannot do that. So part of the problem is, you know, how you have a platform that is uh, smart enough to do more complex financial modeling and and also has the security of Bitcoin, because all the other platforms are building their own security model, and they are still going in the process of maturing it. They don't have a clear path of how they will achieve an equal level of security as Bitcoin has. So we didn't want to wait three years until we could have real, I don't know, micro-lending programs working in, with the development banks in Latin America. We wanted to do it next year. Yeah, so this kind of gets gets to the heart of, you know, the network effects that Bitcoin has. You have 
you know, the first network effect, you have speculation, then you have merchants, then you have consumers, then you have miners, and then you have developers, financialization, world reserve currencies. So like the fifth network effect of the developers, they're going to want to build on the most secure blockchain. And the miners that are the fourth network effect, you know, they're going to be incentivized to secure the blockchain that has more of this block reward, more of this value that goes to the miners. And so, like, Ethereum might be a nice project, but because it's not the most secure blockchain, it's going to have a very difficult time overcoming the network effects that Bitcoin has. Is that kind of the thinking that's uh, going on there? Yes, I think uh, there will be space for maybe more than one smart contracts platform. But sure, I, I mean, part of the thinking why we decided not to issue our, our own token, because root coins are indeed Bitcoin's lock on the Bitcoin blockchain. They are not a new token created out of the blue. It was exactly what you're mentioning. We wanted to incentivize all the mining industry that is already invested in Bitcoin uh, to to jump in the bandway on smart contracting and profit from it in Bitcoin, which is the currency they know, the currency that has huge liquidity, they can turn into wherever they want to turn their Bitcoin. So the idea is to profit from the network effect Bitcoin has and give new incentives to the main players in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And that's also reflected in the governance model we are still working or still building for Rootstock. Now, you mentioned that there's some specific use cases already identified. Can you give an example or two of, of those? Well, a very, simple, a very simple example is creating peg assets that are backed by cryptocurrencies. So it's kind of going back to the gold standard, but with transparency of cryptocurrencies. So you could have a peso or a dollar then has a collateral in cryptocurrencies, I don't know, 10x the amount you are issuing with a collateral in cryptocurrencies, and a smart contract that is following the price fluctuations between, between those two assets to ensure that the collateral is good enough. How does it follow that? Like, what? how do you trust the oracle, for example? Well, what you do is you have multiple oracles. Uh, Sergio has uh, many many models to work around that so you 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 take out the outliers of the of the pricing model and and you can have something that is of course is not mathematically perfect but it's good enough for a real i mean secure enough for a real case scenario so i think we have enough sources or feeders to create something that is trustable at least in, in USDs or other currencies. What would be another use case besides like euros or dollars or gold? Are we going to be able to put in like limit orders onto the blockchain that self-execute, things like uh, that? Absolutely. I mean, that those, those use cases uh, are also possible. And I mentioned this one of the peg asset because I see it as a cornerstone of a bigger system which can enable micro lending, uh, you know, in a big scale, which can enable, I don't know, KYC, layer KYC for people who doesn't have an ID, a reputation model that will go under, uh, under that system. So we can actually build a P2P financial system where different actors can plug and, and act, you know, as issuers, as collateral providers, as different, they can fulfill different parts of what the banking system does today. So I, what I see is, that, you know, this can be the enabler of many big things. But of course, you can do very smart things or very interesting things with the blockchains we already have and with the cryptocurrencies we already have. So we can reprogram many of the, I don't know, a decentralized exchange can be programmed in Rustic for sure. Yeah, so I mean, those are kind of easy abstractions to get our head around. What about the more complex abstractions, like with the Internet of Things or with supply chains of businesses, do we have additional applications that have already been identified for like those areas? Yes, of course. That's the contract enforcement for a smart property, for example. It's it's not. It's another big application. So I I always like to play with this idea of creating the Google taxi. So you get a Google car, you put a you know you create the smart contract and a Bitcoin wallet, and the passengers jump in, they open a payment channel, they jump down, the payment channel closes, 
and then the, the, the Google taxi, you know, will go to the station, pay for its fuel, go to the, uh, to, to, I mean, if the, if it gets broken, it can self diagnose and see if it's fixed and pay to the mechanic uh, for the fixing. So all the things would be possible in Rostock today. It's not that we are talking science fiction. I mean, the elements are there. So in that sense, I think the, the potential is, is huge. So this is actually going to be able to help extend Bitcoin, Absolutely. you could say. Like it's going Absolutely. to be very, very helpful in extending Bitcoin's usefulness. Uh, that's how we see it. And, and the idea is to extend Bitcoin potential while protecting its true value as, as the settlement layer for, for the global economy. You know? So, so that's, that's the concept. It's don't, don't fool around with its Bitcoin core value. Build on top. And that's how we think. We think like an OC, OSI layer. You know? So you have store of value on the bottom layer that is Bitcoin. Then you have business uh, rules execution and storage on the roots of layer, layer. And we will have a framework on top of solutions that will enable fast decentralized applications creations. And then you will have the final layer of decentralized applications that will interact with the end user. And so we're really getting at the fifth network effect of the developers, you know, building out a lot of these useful use cases, but also the taking root with this seventh network effect of global world reserve currency status. Because, like, we can't do this with the dollar or the euro. No, because you Why lack not? transparency. I mean, the, the, the beauty of having a crypto currency or a crypto token is that you can have a level of transparency and a control over its emission that you cannot have in any other currency. No, I mean, you know that better than, than well, myself. And what about the, uh, the just the extensibility and the programmability? Uh, you don't really have that with the dollar either. You have well, to you have to do you have to accomplish that through legal code and through contract and through you know a lot of other things. You're not able to ha- get the trust minimization that comes from the programmable money and the smart contracts and the smart property, etc. Exactly. Right. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I when I do presentations and comparison charts of Bitcoin versus the USD or Bitcoin versus the gold itself, I add a new. They always uh, talk about the, the basic attributes of money. And Bitcoin is the first one that adds a new attribute that is programmability. I mean, and, and extensibility. And extensibility. Yeah. So for sure, that's a new attribute. And, and I think what we are doing is taking the basic scripting of Bitcoin and taking it to the next level. So we are building on that as well. So switching gears and talking about the Latin American Bitcoin community, you've been a major leader, organized the first Latin American Bitcoin conference in Buenos Aires, the second one in Rio de Janeiro, the third one in uh, La Ciudad de Mexico. BitPay's transaction volumes have been off the charts in Latin America. The you know, page views have been just up tremendously across the board. Like, what is going on? in Latin America? I mean, why, why are we seeing all this activity starting to happen? I think if you have to summarize it all, because there's a need for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? Like Argentina uh, and Venezuela yeah. need, need something like Bitcoin? <laughs> uh, absolutely. So I think one, one thing is, uh, you know, if you go to the U.S. or you go to Europe, I think Bitcoin is not needed there yet. I mean, it, in general, things work. But in Latin America, things don't work, don't work at all. So I think Latin America is ripe for disruption. Of course, the cultural process of understanding the digitalization of money, not even cryptocurrencies, I mean, the very basic layers of the digitalization of money will take time, but that's starting to happen. And the other component we have is there is a need, there is a long tradition of mysterious uh, ministries of economy <laughs> playing around with people people's wealth and all the records burning down and mysterious yes, fires of course, and things like that of this. course because you have to do the full thing no you have to <laughs> <laughs> you have to completely spoil it all the evidence all the evidence exactly <laughs> Um, Reset the ledger. <laughs> exactly. Well, the, Just like Ripple. There, there you go. That's, 
that's a good example of why you need a, an immutable, you know, ledger and, and very well replicated. So, so I think that's that's one thing. I mean, the need is there. People is very aware of how crises impact their their life. I mean, the economic crises impact their life. The other thing is we have a thriving startups community. I mean, it's amazing. You mentioned Bitpagos, but we have like maybe 20 startups in Latin America. Maybe more, I think. I, I, I think I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm falling short. Satoshi Tango, Koi Bank, Bitpagos, uh, Bitso. What are, what are some of the other ones down well, here? You have in Chile, Jaikui. You have a guy that is doing a kind of an Airbnb with cryptocurrencies where you can pay and get do the login into the apartment oh, that's without cool. a key. So Smart lock. Yeah. A smart lock. So, And then you have all the Brazilian ones. So you have maybe seven. Oh, CoinBR. Uh, yes. Uh, Mercado Bitcoin. Mercado Bitcoin and Foxbee. Taringa and with Winces' uh, uh, Zappo integration. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of activity going yes, on here. Yes, absolutely. So, so it's not only that you have the need, but somebody's building the, the solutions as well. So I think that combination is what, uh, you know, making Latin America start to, to have a, a big activity. I think we, of course, we are behind the U.S. in terms of adoption and everything, but also because technological integration, I mean, the, the adoption of smartphones is lower in Latin America. I mean, we are maybe two, three years behind, but we will catch up and we are catching up. And I think that's also a key part of what's going on. So. Latin America is catching up on smart smartphone adoption. The need is there. We're starting to have very good uh, startups that are doing a great job taking Bitcoin to, to the masses. So, yes, I, I see a, a bright future. And, and from the NGO, we are doing also the ugly work of talking to regulators, talking to the traditional financial institutions, which many of them don't see Bitcoin as a threat but as an opportunity. And that's what we are working with. I mean, trying to make them see that innovation is going to happen and they can either dismiss it and lose the, the train or they can start working on it right now. Now, you know, I like to ask all of our guests, you know, if we look at Bitcoin or as a good or service that we hire to perform a particular job or task for us, why do you hire Bitcoin? In my case, it's, I would say it's a, an unusual answer because when I, I click with Bitcoin, when I decided to, to devote my life to Bitcoin back in 2012, I saw the potential for social disruption. That's something I always chase for since the 90s when I started with the web. So I would hire him uh, or her to to transform society for good and for the better. I mean, and to make financial inclusion a reality and, and to give freedom to to everybody. How, how can Bitcoin help do that for, like, how, how can it help do that, though? Oh, basically removing the need for trust in a third party. I mean, uh, creating a direct link between people. I mean, the, the freedom to, to association, you know, the freedom of association, the freedom to, to trade. Uh, money for me, it's uh, the representation of human effort. So, I mean, if you change how we exchange human effort, you are changing the core of society. You know? it's, it's the blood of the society. Well, we've had a, just a, an excellent and tremendous interview with Diego Gutierrez, one of the founders of Rootstock and a major leader in the Latin American Bitcoin scene. Thanks so much for being with us, Diego. Thank you very much for having me with you. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at Bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. 
Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate.